I'm a person who enjoys phrases, and particularly, I enjoy phrases that we use in this world that have biblical basis. And, and some of them are well known. Uh, the story of David and Goliath. You know, we use the, it's a David and Goliath, particularly when we're talking about underdog situation in sports. And most people, even if they don't have much of or any church background, know that's something from the Bible. Know it's a Bible story. But there are a lot of phrases that are used in this world that are from the Bible that people may not realize. And sometimes we see that um, um, uh, these phrases aren't, aren't super well-known, but w one of them that's not a well-known phrase that we don't use very much is take up the mantle. And what that phrase means is that basically somebody is taking up the responsibility that, of somebody else. And for various reasons, but taking up the mantle is taking up the responsibility of the next person to assume leadership responsibility of some level. But, but this this phrase is take up the mantle is from uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. It's the story when Elijah is taken up to heaven. So God has made it clear that Elijah is going to be taken up to heaven. He doesn't die in the traditional sense. God just kind of takes him away. It's a, it's a crazy story. Chariots of fire. It's, it's pretty cool. But uh, his apprentice at the time is Elisha. And when he asked his apprentice, said, hey, what do you want from me? And Elisha asked for a double portion of his blessing. And, and basically, if Elijah witnesses Elijah being taken up to heaven, then, then, God, then God will grant that request. And so, so they go, God takes Elijah up to heaven, Elijah sees it, so the request, request is granted. But what happens right after that is Elijah takes up the, his master's cloak, Elijah's cloak, picks it up, and he goes and do, does ministry. And another name for cloak is mantle. And so, so basically, that's where we get this take up the mantle. Elisha takes up the mantle of Elijah and begins his ministry as the spiritual leader of the people of Israel. Now, there's a, a hymn about this particular story, this Bible story, and it's, the hymn is called, Let Thy Mantle Fall on Me. All right, Dolores knew where I was going with that one, didn't you? So, but uh, um, and so, so it's it's a, it's a hymn, and and um, honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the of the hymn. The, the the melody doesn't speak to me. But the first three verses are about Elijah and Elisha, and and the chorus is, "Let thy mantle follow me, let thy mantle follow me, a double portion of thy spirit, Lord, let thy mantle follow me." And it's okay. But one of the things I really like about this hymn, and it's what really makes it memorable, and, and it's the only hymn I know that does this, at least in our hymn book, is it has a key change. Most hymns don't have a key change. Now, and this key change is not just because the, the composers thought it'd be musically fun to do this. There's a theological uh, thing that's happening in this moment, because from verse 3 to verse 4, Four, there's a shift, and that shift is when the key change happens, and it's when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, start talking about Pentecost. So verses 4 and 5 are about, in the upper room they waited was the faithful Christian band. We need some new lyrics for that one too. But, uh, the, but, but it goes into, let thy spirit fall on me, let thy spirit fall on me, the promised blessing may I be out Poured. Let thy spirit fall on me. What does that look like for us? What does it mean for the spirit to be outpoured? Now we find that actually happens. The promise of the Holy Spirit is given in Acts chapter 2. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, we call that sanctification. And there's different levels of sanctification that we can talk about. But when, the Holy, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's sanctification. That is a theological term we use for it. And we find the Holy Spirit is given in Acts chapter 2. This is when it starts. This is when it happens. This is when the promise actually comes to God's people, to the disciples. But there are some Pentecost prerequisites. Because this first day when the Holy Spirit is given is called Pentecost. There's some prerequisites that happen that have to happen in order for this moment to occur. And we've been looking at a lot of the things about Jesus. We looked about his, his annunciation, the, the fact that he was proclaimed to be born, of his incarnation when he was born, the baptism, the, the uh, temptation, the transfiguration, his crucifixion, where Jesus was killed, and his resurrection. 
In the last few weeks, we've, we've looked about at his time with the disciples, how he, his, he presented himself to them, how he brought clarification to them. And last week, we looked at the ascension, and Jesus had to leave in order for the Holy Spirit to come. And these are all the things about Jesus that had to take place in order for the Holy Spirit to be given. And so we get to this moment, and this moment where the Holy Spirit is given is Pentecost, and Pentecost is a day of beginning. It's a day of newness, of, of, of fresh, of anointing, and it shows another part of God's redemption for his people. But there's an interesting thing to consider when you look at, at the history of the church. And, and we as, as Western Christians have, have this idea that, well, there were the Catholics, and then around the 1500s, Martin Luther uh, nailed his thesis to the, the church, and now we have the Protestants with Lutherans, Baptists, Methodists. Well, even before then, there was a different group. See, the Roman Catholics weren't the only church for the first 1,500 years of Christianity. There's Eastern Orthodox. And, and for some reason, we forget about them. But, but, the, but there's a different emphasis that we find throughout the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church today and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Because what, what happens with, with the, our church that we're familiar with is we have this, this, this emphasis on the physical nature of things. We focus on the church as the body of Christ, like we are a group of people going out and doing the work of Jesus, which we are. And so the issue is not that we have, have, have wrong teaching, but we have different emphasis. What the Eastern Church does is it has a high connection between Christology, the study of Christ, high connection between Christ and the Spirit. And so they, they, they view them in their oneness and how that impacts us and how that shapes us and how the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is part of who Jesus is, which drives the direction of the church. But here's what I conclude. God invades when we obey. When we submit ourselves to Jesus, God's going to start doing work in our lives. See, but until we submit ourselves to Jesus, God is hindered. God, God, God isn't going to force himself upon us. But when we surrender ourselves to him, he does more work in us. And this is what happens in, in Acts chapter 2, where you see Pentecost happened. Because in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were standing together in the same place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were staying. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them. <clears throat> so the day of Pentecost, we find that all the believers are together. They're, they're waiting for what Jesus has promised would come. He said, wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. At the end of, of Luke and in the first chapter of Acts, the, we see that Jesus has ascended to heaven and he's told his disciples, wait. You got to wait to fulfill the mission that I've given you until you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Pentecost, penta means 50. And so we're 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, that, that he appeared to his disciples from time to time, the 40 days after his resurrection, showing them that he was really alive. And then he, took, he left, he ascended to heaven, and he said, wait until you get the Holy Spirit. And so here we are, finally at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is given. But this also coincides with the, um, with the Jewish festival, the Feast of Weeks. And it's one of the major Jewish festivals that they have, and, and the Feast of Weeks is 50 days after Passover. You know, Passover was the, the, the largest Jewish celebration, or the most emphasized one, the one they deemed uh, most important. But it was um, also the one that they were celebrating when Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb. But see, before the disciples can go be the witnesses that Jesus has called them to be, they have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But this moment of Pentecost, it encompasses all the senses. It starts with a loud sound. 
a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. I mean, we've had some windstorms here recently. It can be awfully scary, right? Usually when a windstorm happens, that's not something that we get excited about in a positive way. It causes destruction. It causes fear. But we also see there's this, the sense of sight. Of There were flames or tongues of fire that settled on each of them. So they see it. Now, now, even if they could, there was no actual smell with the fire, when you see things, you can kind of smell them. The memories that you can, you can smell, this, this fire, the smoke, right? They're together. All these senses are coming together. It's not just something that they know in their mind. They sense them. They see them. They feel them. Now, one of the things we have to recognize is that the Holy Spirit was not absent in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is just prevalent now. The Holy Spirit is abundantly given. That is the shift that's happening in Acts chapter 2, because there are multiple instances throughout the Old Testament where we see the Holy Spirit is present. So it's not as though the Holy Spirit was absent. It's just more prevalent and more freely given in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit is now personal and communal, and it marks the birthday of the church. Jesus established the church in Matthew 16, where he tells Peter... Hey, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church. Talking about the confession of Jesus is the rock. But then we get to Acts chapter 2, and now it is the official birthday of the church. You see, what, 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 what the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us, and it gives us the power of Jesus. It gives us the truth of Jesus. It gives us the love of Jesus. It imparts the life of Jesus into us as followers of Jesus. But another thing the Holy Spirit does is it gives both power and purity. I think a lot of times we can talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit enables us to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given us. The Holy Spirit makes it possible for us to do what God has called us to do. And we're okay with it. The Holy Spirit also purifies. You know, this concept of Holy Spirit fire. That, that's a, the fire is a common imagery we use to describe and talk about the Holy Spirit. And fire purifies. Fire cleanses. Fire also can change things. It, it moves the needle and makes things different than how they were. So the Holy Spirit can come into your life and simultaneously give you power and purify you. But I come back to this concept that God invades when we obey. When we live in obedience to Jesus, he is going to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us, and he is going to move in our lives. Now, I love how verse 4 of, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in other languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them. See, what this does is it shows that the Holy Spirit can break down barriers. I, I speak one language. I took Spanish in high school. I took Greek in college. I, I am not bilingual. I speak one language. And so to me, it, it's, it's crazy how the Holy Spirit can empower individuals in this moment to speak other languages. But make sure we, we don't forget how God is connecting the dots and showing how he is reversing the results of sin. Because language is a barrier that's a result of sin. In Genesis chapter 11, we have the story of the Tower of Babel. And because of pride and arrogance and sinful behavior, other languages into the world. But we see that God is in the process of reversing this. His redemptive plans is to reverse this, the curse of sin so creation is restored to how it was before sin. So God is, is reversing this. He's doing things different. He is making things new. Now, this concept of speaking in tongues or speaking in other languages can make some people awfully nervous. We get real queasy when we talk about it. And there are passages, other passages talk about, about speaking in tongues, and, and uh, um, there's some that they talk about, Apostle Paul says, if there's no interpreter, he'd be quiet, and that uh, only a couple should speak, that 
that we need to make sure that, that we are able to understand the message that God has given us. Now, there are layers to speaking in tongues, um, but one of the things that we find, particularly in this moment in Acts chapter 2, is God bridges barriers so that his message can be understood. God is not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. He's not a God who wants to hide himself. He is a God who reveals himself to us. God doesn't do that to confuse us. Now, there are times you may be unsure. There's times we may have confusion, but it's not because God is trying to trick you and he's having a fun time doing it. God wants you to know him and to, and, and for, for, he wants us to know him and he wants to know us. But as I think about speaking in, in tongues and this language barrier, a story comes to mind that I've shared before. And a college teammate, his name, his name is Ernest Arias. He, was, he, he grew up in Venezuela. I believe he's back there. I know he's in South America, but I, I believe he's back in Venezuela. Now, I went to college in Illinois. He played junior college baseball in Iowa. Now, I didn't know much about the Iowa geography at that time, so I didn't ask many details. But he went to a community college in Iowa, so, but I don't know where. And he didn't really, he couldn't speak English. Don't know how he got into a college when he couldn't speak English, but he couldn't speak English. Um, God bless America. But uh, um, he had a teammate that kept asking him to come to church, come to church, come to church. He had no interest in going to church. Eventually, to stop his teammate from asking him, he went to church. And he sat there as they sang the songs, not able to understand any of the songs. Sat there as they prayed, as they did the offering, as they did the announcements. They couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand any of that. But the moment the preacher got up and started preaching, he understood every word that was spoken. And it was, it's one of those things where, now that didn't happen every day. Or at least we're not aware of those things happening every day. But the fact of the matter is, God is a God who wants to make himself known. And he can cross any barrier that we encounter. And that's what happens here in Acts chapter 2. But there were people that took notice of this. Because we continue in verse 5. See, at that time there were devout Jews from every nation staying in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, they came running to see what was happening, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. They said, how can this be? They said, these people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in their own native languages. And then they go and they list all of the, the areas which are represented here, which we see the Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, the people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of Libya around Cyrene, the visitors from Rome, including Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear all these people speaking our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Now, I'm not real great on my my first century geography of the area, but there are a lot of areas represented right there. A lot of world areas, a lot of different ethnicities and groups that, that, uh, that are present here in Jerusalem. But one of the things that's happening here is there's this concept called the diaspora. And this is basically the Jews that have been dispersed. If you remember when Assyria and Babylon came and defeated Jerusalem and God's people, they deported a lot of the, the Israelites, a lot of the Jews that were there. And so, I mean, a lot of them after 70 years were, were able to go back to rebuild Jerusalem, the palace and, and the walls. But a lot of them then begin to be dispersed around the world. And so what we find here is, is we find these are Jews that are part of the diaspora, the ones who are Jews but don't live in the promised land area. So what we find is happening here is at God's proclamation, his truth, the Holy Spirit 
begins by being shared with the faithful Jews. The ones who were God's people, who were visiting this area because they came to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. They were there because they were devout followers of God. They weren't there just because they're like, you know, this is a great vacation spot. They were there because they were seeking God. Now, the Passover is likely the, the, the most emphasized religious holiday that the Jews have. But some estimate that the Feast of Weeks is actually the one that has the greatest number of people from around, from, from global areas come to it. And the reason is, Passover is March, maybe early April. The Feast of Weeks is May into early June, somewhere in there, depending on how the calendar falls with the lunar cycle. The Mediterranean is pretty dangerous in the March and early April time frame. It's much safer to travel in April and into June. And so it's likely that the world travelers, those who had to come a long way, would, would, would be more inclined to come on the Feast of Weeks as opposed to the Passover celebration. Now, regardless, we might be splitting hairs with this. Passover and the Feast of Weeks were highly attended festivals. A lot of people came. So whether we're talking about the crucifixion, which was the Passover, or we're talking about Pentecost, which is Feast of Weeks, we see that God is meeting his people where they are. But I come back to God invades when we obey. These, these devout Jews were seeking God, coming for this religious festival, trying to encounter God, and God invaded in this moment. But the Holy Spirit was heard. This, this sound like, like the, the, the rushing windstorm, people heard it. They came running, and so we see that insiders and outsiders both experienced this, both heard it, both knew that something was happening. People noticed. Now, the tongues that were listed there, that, that it was a, uh, what appeared like flames or tongues of fire, shows the universality of the gospel that Jesus came for everybody, and we see all the languages that were spoken, all the areas that were represented, shows that God came for everyone. But I, I'm, I've always been, been moved when I just, I, I keep thinking about God's timing in this moment. We can look at a lot of different things throughout Scripture and what God does, and we see God knows what he's doing. Like, for God to orchestrate all of this together in this way, it's just kind of, you take a step back and say, man, our, our God's got this. Our God knows what he's doing. He knows how to accomplish his mission. We also see his love. The fact that God wasn't rejecting Israel. He didn't reject the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't say, well, you guys failed. I'm going to move on. He made it so that they could respond, so that these devout Jews who were seeking God could experience this moment and respond to him with also the idea that not everybody could make it there. For the highest number of rep nations were represented there. You know what happened after the festival? They went home. And they tell people, guess what happened? Guess what experience I had? So it was an evangelistic strategy as well for God to multiply the work that he was doing. But reaching people is what God wanted. So Pentecost shows God's goodness to his people. Now I want to pause for just a moment. I've said a couple times, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Pentecost is not the birthday of the Holy Spirit. We want to make sure we recognize that Holy Spirit is fully God. The God we serve reveals himself in three persons in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Son is being Jesus. God is eternal. So God the Holy Spirit, fully God, just like God the Son and God the, the, the Father, God the Spirit, Holy Spirit, fully God. Wasn't born here, is eternal, has always been and always will be. And so I want to make sure we're clear that I'm not saying the Holy Spirit was born. Holy Spirit has always been 
part of the plan, part of who God is. But we see with the Holy Spirit that God meets his people where they are. Now, we can think of where we are personally. All of you can understand the language I am speaking. Now, we may have vernacular that is different. We may have phrases that are odd or weird that that aren't the same. But if God can cross language barriers, God can cross vernacular barriers as well. He can cross all of these barriers because God gives the message so it will be known. When we read the Word of God, we may not fully understand it, but God is revealing Himself to us. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand what God wants for us. Now, sometimes that means we have to ask somebody else. Whether that's reading some type of scholar or author, whether it's asking another a fellow Christian. Like, like that's how God can reveal Himself to us. God making Himself known is not that you know everything and don't need anybody else. That's not what God making himself known means. But when you consider the context of what was happening in this moment, and there's no conclusive proof or evidence for this, but a lot of scholars kind of agree that in order to reach almost everybody, only two languages were really needed. If the disciples wanted to communicate this, this good news about Jesus, that the Holy Spirit was here, that all of that had to do with what they were talking about. They just needed two languages. One was Aramaic, which every Jew would have spoken. Most peoples could speak more than one language in this time. And uh, um, they, uh, so Aramaic is one. And the other one is Greek. Those are the two main languages that if the disciples would have been speaking those two languages probably 99% of the people could understand what they were saying. But the text tells us not that the people could understand what they were saying, but they hear the disciples, the believers, speaking in their own native languages. So it's not as though the people just could understand, they heard it in their own language. Now, if you, are, if you speak multiple languages, you have a mother language. You have a language in which you are most comfortable that you understand more clearly than any other. And so we find that these people that the believers are speaking to are hearing this message in their mother language and the one that they understand most clearly because God wants people to know him. God wants you to know him. He wants you to know him intimately as much as we can comprehend but it's a matter of, are we going to obey? Because God will invade when we obey. When we submit ourselves to him, when we humble ourselves before him, God will move in our lives. But people still might not understand what's happening. And that, 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 that was the response. In verses 12 and 13, we find that the crowd stood there perplexed and amazed. They just listed all of the, the nations and areas represented and say, hey, we're hearing these people speak our own languages about all the wonderful things God is doing. They stood there perplexed and amazed, saying, what can this mean? But there's always going to be some naysayers. There's always going to be that person or those people. And they ridiculed the believers, and they said, they're just drunk. That's all. That was their conclusion. That, that is what they decided what was happening in this moment. Now, we don't know the percentage of who, who thought it was legitimate, who didn't, but we, we get the impression that people investigated. They went running. When they heard the loud noise, they went running. They were saying, what is happening here? And as I think about their experience, I kind of get to the conclusion, uh, most of them were saying, I don't know what's going on. I just know something's going on. I'm not sure what's happening. We hear my own language is being spoken by these people who have no business knowing the language I speak. So something's happening here. I might not be able to fully, fully articulate it, but something is happening. But as, as I mentioned, you know, we look at God's timing and we say, man, God just knows what he's doing. 
And there's two, there's another level to that. Because I, I think we can all resonate, okay, God made it so the most number of Jews possible could be exposed to this so that they could receive this good news of Jesus. Well, the Feast of Weeks was a specific celebration. And part of what it celebrated was the giving of the law which the Old Testament has some prophecies about, connecting that to the Spirit. And my favorite one is Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. It says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take away your stony, stubborn, hard, unresponsive heart, and give you a heart that is tender, that is responsive, give you a heart of flesh. In verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. That's what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. At the time that the Jews celebrated the giving of the law, God fulfilled the prophecy where he said, I will give you my spirit and write my law on your hearts. You know one of the limitations of the law? is that it's this external list of rules that all it does is it tells you when you mess up. Now, the law is not bad. The Apostle Paul is very clear of that. It's not as though the law is bad. It's just that our sinful nature gets in the way. But God says here in Ezekiel 36, says in Jeremiah 31 as well, that I'm going to take that external list of rules and I'm going to dwell inside of you so that you will fulfill this external list of rules. I'm going to give you the ability to follow my regulations, but you're not going to be governed by this external list anymore. You're going to be governed and ruled and directed and empowered by my spirit living in you. What a transformative moment. And God does this in such a God way, in a way that looking back like, wow, God knows what he is doing but there's always going to be people that don't, don't recognize it. See, the people, the devout Jews that were staying in Jerusalem that came and investigated what was happening had no context to understand what was going on. So it seems as though the best guess they could come up with is that the people were drunk, they were intoxicated, that they had some type of influence on them. They were acting uh, strangely, and the only thing they could come up with is that they must be drunk, must have alcohol. But as we think of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not limited to a personal gift that you are to hoard. The Holy Spirit is both private and communal. It's, it's both for you as an individual, but also it's for us as the body of Christ, as those who call the name of the Lord, as those who believe in Jesus. It's both. A lot of times we focus so much on the individual components of faith that we do so at the expense of the communal aspects of faith. And it's a both and. If we individualize the individual Audi side of things so much, then really what we get is a Judges concept, the book of Judges. Read the book of Judges. Not a real pleasant bedtime story. But it, a couple times says close to the end, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And what was right in their own eyes was destruction after destruction after destruction. But see, if we only talk about the communal side of things, then we forget, you know, Jesus has called us to a personal relationship with him. He's called us to daily spend private time with him. So we have both sides, and we can't neglect one for the other. We can't contain or limit the Holy Spirit. It's not just for us. It's not just for our own ideas. It's not for us to put in a box. As I think about what the believers were doing, how they were acting, and how they were perceived by the people that came to investigate, the word that comes to mind is weird. People saw what the believers were doing, and they say, well, that's weird. Now, there may be things that we're comfortable with, like in our own skin, like if people think it's, it's weird or odd or, or unusual. But in general, most people don't want to be classified as weird. We, we don't. 
You know, Craig Rochelle has this book that, that I, I, it's really good, and the title speaks about it, but it has a lot of practical applications. But the book is titled Weird Because Normal Isn't Working Anymore. Because a lot of times what happens is there's followers of Jesus who are trying to follow Jesus and, and look normal according to the world's standard at the same time. But if you took an evaluation of your life, outside of coming to church, being present at this activity, are there, is there anything in your life about following Jesus that someone who doesn't follow Jesus would say, man, that's weird. Would people confuse you with being weird? Or are you somebody who follows Jesus but also looks normal according to the standards of the world? I'm not sure I've met any people who are weird for Jesus. I've met weird people, but I'm not sure I've met many people who are weird for Jesus. That's a holdup for us because we don't want to be classified as weird. We don't want to be ostracized. We don't want people to not associate with us. Because if we're weird for Jesus, if we're that intense of Jesus that people say, oh gosh, I don't know about that person, you know, it may mean we might miss out on those friendships. Or might miss out on that job promotion. Or might miss out on this experience. Are we willing to sacrifice those things for Jesus? Because in this moment, we find that the Holy Spirit controlled the believers without hindrance. There was nothing that the, that the believers were holding back. The people that were in the same place together, all the believers were meeting together in one place, all of them that were there, that everyone that was present was filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled without hindrance. The question I have to ask you is what holds you back? I don't have to ask it to you. I could, I could say, hey, hope you feel better. Go home and eat some good lunch, and we'll see you next week. But what holds you back? What holds you back from being filled like the Holy Spirit, like the believers were on the day of Pentecost? What holds you back from experiencing that power that they experienced then? What's preventing the Holy Spirit from having his way in your life? Not most of his way, completely. What's holding you back from that? What's holding us back as individuals? What's holding us back as a community? Because we can't neglect one for the sake of the other. As I was thinking about this, I was recognizing sometimes I think what happens is we tend to not put very much effort into our spiritual health. Now, if you think about it for a moment, we do a lot to make sure that our physical health is, is at least acceptable. Now, some people are, are extra motivated and exercise and do all those types of things, but everybody eats. We all eat. If you don't eat, you're not going to be physically healthy. Now, sometimes we make bad choices when we eat. But the fact of the matter is, we eat food so that we can physically function. And we do it all the time. We do it multiple times a day. Most of you have already eaten today. Some of you haven't, but you've had coffee. It's, we can count that, I guess. We also breathe. Right? That's physical effort we put forth to make sure that we are physically able to function. Well, we, we, we drink water, we, we sleep, right? We sleep hours every day so that we can function. We put so much, and I'm not even talking about our health care. I'm not even talking about the supplements we take or, or whatever else we do. We put so much effort to make sure that we can physically function. How much effort do we put forth so that we are spiritually healthy? I'd say they don't even come close to comparing. And I think that lies at the root of a lot of our problems. Of we're neglecting the spiritual side of things. Uh, we believe about Jesus, but man, the Holy Spirit's kind of an add-on. 
We like the Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit. We just don't want the Holy Spirit to have complete control over us. And for about the last year and a half, there's this hymn that I just can't get out of my head. I just, just can't. And um, I, I, I'm nervous, but I'm going to sing the song, so I need you to sing it with me. Okay? If, if you're under mm, a lot, of, lot um, you're, you're probably not going to know it. I mean, we've sang it here now, but... We find many people who can't understand why we... Sing it louder! So we have and free. We've crossed over Jordan to Canaan's fair land, and this is like heaven to me. Oh, this is like heaven to me. Yes, this is like heaven to me. I've crossed over Jordan to Canaan's fair land, and this is like heaven to me. I don't know why every church in Iowa is not their theme song, but that's neither here nor there. But the crossover Jordan, if you remember in the story of Joshua, when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River, that's when they entered the promised land. That's when they entered the land that was their inheritance. It was theirs. Now, they had to fight for it still. There's some battles that they still had to, to wage. There was some still conflict that happened in order for them to, to have security. And actually, they didn't fully accomplish the mission because they got distracted. But the fact of the matter is because of Jesus, we can sing the song, This is like heaven to me. But as I'm thinking about this song, I think there's a lot of people who can't sing that song. I'm following Jesus, but man, this isn't heaven. If this is heaven, I don't want a piece of this. Now, I think there's two things at play here. First off, I think we're viewing it as circumstantial. Like, peace is not circumstantial. The fruit of the Spirit, peace, is trust in the one who saves us. It's not that we have a lack of conflict. But but I, I can't get past the second verse because that is where we find the problem, I think. So when we are happy, we sing and we shout. Some don't understand us, I see. We're filled with the Spirit, there isn't a doubt. Is there? We're filled with the Spirit, there isn't a doubt? I think there might be room for doubt on that one. And when I say doubt, room for the Holy Spirit to do some more work in us. Because until we're filled with the Holy Spirit, singing this is like heaven to me is just words. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be part of a religious organization that all we are is words. Because you know, you know what? The, the, the joy, the, the power that we find in the Holy Spirit is, is not about the things we do. It's not about the number of Bible studies you attend. It's not about the, the food at the potluck. It's not about the amount you give. The power of what we have is about the Holy Spirit. It's not about our programs. It's not about what we do, it's about who we serve, and it's about letting him have complete control over our lives. Pentecost was not, you know, we got nothing better to do. Let's just do some weird stuff and make people really confused. And that's how a lot of churches seem to function. And we find a lot of dissatisfaction with that. But if we, as individuals, and a community said, you know what? There's, I just want more of the Spirit. Amen. And talk about the perspective that would do for us. Because, you know, if you can't sing the song, this is like heaven to me, and mean it, you know what the problem is? It's you and the Holy Spirit. It's not the person next to you. It's not the person across the way. It's not your neighbor. It's not your friend. It's not your coworker. It's between you and the Holy Spirit. Right. Not between anybody else. So if we find that we're dissatisfied, 
if we find that, that, that we aren't experiencing the joy that Jesus wants to pour out upon us. You know what the problem is? It's you and the Holy Spirit. It's not anything or anyone else. I want to be part of a church that is individuals and a community. We can sing, this is like heaven to me. That we can say, we're filled with the Spirit. There isn't a doubt. And we can say, there isn't a doubt. There's no doubt. There is no doubt that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. But there is doubt. I see doubt in all the churches. I, I, I see doubt everywhere. It's the Spirit. That's what we need. And until we have the Spirit, no amount of us is going to fix anything. No amount of us is going to change the world. No amount of us is going to accomplish anything worth anything if we don't have the Spirit. So not only are we willing to be weird, are we willing to humble ourselves? The Holy Spirit invades, God invades when we obey. And obedience requires that we come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm nothing else. I'm yours. That's what we need. Jesus didn't die so that we could say a few words, hope for the best, and just wait. Jesus died so that we could begin to experience victory here and now. He died so that our lives, our situations, our mentalities, everything about us could be transformed. He died so that you could begin new life now, not later. I, I, but we have to make sure we recognize that he died not so that you could begin life way over here and then just continue to wait. We got to come back and get more of Jesus and more of Jesus. And more of Jesus. If you're not coming back to get more of Jesus on a consistent basis, then you are spiritually starving yourselves. And you wouldn't dream doing that physically. Now, there are times you may fast, but you're not going to fast for weeks and months and years. And sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe our, our spiritual lives are, well, I'll eat eat a few things every once in a while. You know, I'll come to church once a week. My Bible doesn't have dust on it. And so, so, so I'm not like totally negligent, but are we actually giving it the attention it deserves? I think this, that's part of the question we have to ask ourselves. 